Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Brian Kell with Kirkpatrick Price, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today entitled, Why Am I Being Asked About SSA 16, and What Do I Need to Know to Talk Intelligently? But first, I would like to uh, thank our partners in presenting this webinar and say how much we are excited to partner with the Printing Industries Alliance, the Printing Association of Florida, and the Printing, Pacific Printing Industries Association. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about each of these uh, partners. The Printing Association of Florida is a not-for-profit association representing the interest of the graphic arts industry throughout the state. More than 300 Florida-based graphic arts companies consider PAF their ultimate business partner. PAF is affiliated with Printing Industries of America, the world's largest graphic arts trade association. Printing Industries Alliance is the trade association representing printing and print-related companies in New York State, New Jersey, and Northwestern Pennsylvania. PA is a regional affiliate of Printing Industries of America and is headquartered in Amherst, New York, with offices in Brooklyn and on Long Island. PIA provides a variety of consultative, informational, and cost-saving services to approximately 400 member firms. Pacific Printing Industries Association works on behalf of companies and schools involved in the ever-changing visual communications industry. As our industry has changed, so too has PPIA continued to work towards greater relevance and broader reach. PPIA offers education, networking, group discounts, services, consulting, marketing, and more for all visual and graphic communication firms in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Alaska, and Hawaii. PPIA supports efforts in the commercial publishing, packaging, labels, point of sale, and related spaces, connecting the industry's best from creation through delivery and all aspects in between. And now let me introduce our speaker for today, Todd Stevenson. Todd is a Vice President at Kirkpatrick Price and is an Information Security and Compliance Specialist and holds a Certified Information Systems Auditor Certification. He has spent the last seven years helping organizations comply with requirements of SSA 16, SOC 2, PCI, DSS, BISMA, ISO 2701, HIPAA, and most recent requirements being enforced by CFPB. And with that, Todd, I will let you take it from here. All right, great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for joining today. I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of talking through some of these audit frameworks and hopefully, hopefully helping you understand a little bit better uh, what they are, why your clients are asking for them, and, and how you uh, can use them in, in your businesses and certainly at, at a minimum be able to talk intelligently with, with your clients and prospective clients. So let me tell you a little bit about KP before we get started. We we are a CPA firm, a licensed CPA firm, and also we're a PCI qualified security assessor. So our focus area is in information security auditing and um, and assurance. So we, we have uh, worked, we're over 10 years old as a firm and have spent a, a considerable amount of time working in the printing industry and have quite a few clients that we work with uh, annually in, in, in the industry. Uh, just a little bit about our services, just so you have a kind of an understanding of what we do. We do a lot of readiness, uh, helping clients prepare for audit, so that's creating policy and procedure and doing risk assessments, things like that. And uh, we, we, of course, we we deliver specific audits and attestations to the to the audits you see listed there, the SSA 16, SOC 2, all the audits we're actually going to be talking about today, we actually perform. So we have a, quite a bit of experience in this. As a CPA, we're, we're a strange CPA in that we don't do uh, financial auditing, for instance. This is, this is all we do. So I just want to share with you a, a little background on all these and help you understand uh, how they fit together. So kind of first off the bat, um, is uh, just acknowledging that there's uh, that it seems like an like an alphabet soup, <laughs> SSA, 60, SOC 2, HIPAA, PCI, all these uh, acronyms. Um, you know, it kind of reminds me of uh, a, a bowl of alphabet soup. And so, you know, the big question today is is what do they all mean? So let's go ahead and get into that. And, and one of the things I want to do first is sort of give you the background. You know, why uh, why are you hearing about these? What's driving the the requirements in the first place? So just to give you sort of a, sort of a background, um, 
several legislations have been passed over the years that drive many, if not most, of these requirements. The first one being uh, the, the HIPAA legislation, which I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with. But in 1996, that law was enacted, which primarily protects um, protected health information, as we call it, PHI. So um, that's ultimately when your client's asking you for a, some sort of uh, assessment to HIPAA, ultimately that, that law is driving it in some way, shape, or form. Then in 1999, the Graham-Leach-Biley uh, Act was enacted, which is commonly referred to as GLBA. But GLBA regulates banking and financial institutions and mandates the protection of PII, personally identifiable information, and requires any financial institution, traditional or non-traditional, to protect that data. Um, then in 2002, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted, again, mandating the protection of information that impacts public financial statements. So again, if, if this law primarily pertains to public entities, publicly traded companies, in an effort to make sure that their financial statements are accurate. So again, the law requires public entities to have adequate internal controls in place to protect um, data that would ultimately impact their financial statement. In the same year, the uh, Federal Information Security Management Act was enacted, which mandates the protection of all data utilized by the federal government and any third party who has access to, to federal data. So, and the FISMA um, legislation specifically references the standard um, published by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, referred to as NIST 800-53, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But again, the bottom line is the federal government by law has to protect its data and is required uh, to make sure third parties do as, as well. Then in 2004, the payment card industry, so the payment card brands, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, got together and created a unified data security standard, which is known as PCI DSS, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. And what's unique about this standard is it's not legislatively driven, it's contractually driven. Ultimately, Visa, MasterCard, um, are through contract require the issuing bank who actually gives out the credit card to enforce PCI compliance under severe penalty. So they then contractually require all those who have merchant accounts that they have to be compliant and of course the uh, under contract the merchants are required to make sure that anyone they do business with is also compliant. So uh, as, as with all of these the compliance flows downhill but in this case it's being driven uh, privately. So the key piece here that I want to help um, uh, explain is that all of these, all of these uh, legislations and PCI included, all require the validation of service providers' compliance to the same standard. So GLBA covers uh, financial institutions, but if they send that data to a service provider in any way or that service provider has access to the data, then they're required by law to ensure that the service provider has the same adequate controls in place as they're required to by law. All of these have the same requirement. So in specifically, we'll, and we'll continue with the financial institution, they have two options to validate the service provider's compliance. They either need to do their direct audit, the direct assessment, and this is why you'll get questionnaires from a bank, why bank auditors might actually come to your site and show up and do an audit. By law, they have to validate you have adequate internal control, either directly, or they can require you to, hire, to have an appropriate third-party audit performed. Um, so again, that was the big question to the legislators, especially with Sarbanes-Oxley and GLBA was, well, what's an, an appropriate third-party audit? What's an example? And the answer at the time was SAS-70. The legislator said, well, SAS-70 is a uh, acceptable audit format. So publicly traded companies and financial institutions standardized on at the time what was called SAS-70 as the means to validate that their third parties have the appropriate controls in place. And since then, SAS-70 was replaced by SSAE-16 in June of 2011. SSAE-16 replaced SAS-70, SAS-70 was retired. And so now those same financial institutions 
and publicly traded companies have then switched and begin asking for SSA 16s. So, um, so, uh, but again, the question is what's appropriate? Well, generally speaking, it depends, well, it depends who's asking, right? That's financial institutions and publicly traded companies almost universally default to SSA 16. But um, but it is all ultimately ends up being one of these these audits that we're talking about today. What makes up what we're calling the alphabet soup? So let's talk a little bit more specifically about um, which type of companies ask for which type of audit, so that you can kind of understand which audit might apply to you, um, particularly if you're looking to move into a new uh, market or new vertical. So. We'll start here with SSA 16, and as I mentioned, publicly traded companies and financial institutions will will generally require this. And both traditional and non-traditional financial institutions, so not just a traditional bank, credit union, commercial bank, national bank, but non-traditional like mortgage lenders or mortgage originators or uh, investment bankers, et cetera. So um, you need to think more broadly than the traditional as well as state and local, interesting. So state and local saw that SSA 16 was the standard, if you will, most commonly requested, and most state and local governments across the country is standardized on SSA 16. So if you're looking to work with a credit union or a bank, you're going to get asked. If you're looking to work with a publicly traded company or if you see an RFP for a state and local municipality, perhaps you're getting an RFP to print uh, statements for the local um, you know, uh, utility, right, gas or, or, or a county water department or something, you'll probably see SSA 16 on the RFP or RFI. So it, it is certainly the most common means of attestation used for service providers in the U.S., So that's and that's why you hear about it. It's also why you don't hear about it if you're primarily marketing to private companies. Um, you know, they're not legislatively um, uh, as pressured legislatively. So. All right, so let's talk a little bit about SOC 2. SOC 2 is interesting. It's a, it was, it's a relatively new audit. So when SSA 16 replaced SAS 70 in June of 2011, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants also created the SOC 2 audit, and it's specifically designed for technology companies. So if you, the classic example would be a data center um, or a software provider, someone who's providing technology services. They created an audit specifically for, for that focus. Um, but the same types of entities asked for SOC 2s that asked for SSA 16. It would be publicly traded companies and primarily financial institutions. But I'll, it is just now being adopted. We're just now hearing companies actually ask for it. Um, and so it's still really just even in the last few months. So it's it's been four years or so, uh, not quite four years, and it's just now gaining some popularity. And we'll talk about what it is a little bit later. <clears throat> so who asked for HIPAA audit? Any entity who handles, you know, protected health information. So you don't have to be working directly with a health health care provider, although that would certainly create the need for HIPAA compliance and a validation, but anyone who is also a service provider of a health care provider, which is known as a business associate, would also um, generate a, a HIPAA compliance requirement to you. So you might be called the business associate if you're working directly with the health care provider, or, but ultimately um, if you're working for the business associate as well, you, you might have to uh, be compliant with HIPAA. So it's, the irony is, is you might be a business associate yourself because you work for a healthcare organization directly, and then you might be a subservice organization of a business associate in another case. So, and this again would be public or private. Um, there's, uh, doesn't matter. Um, you're all, all healthcare companies are required to protect uh, PHI. So who asked for a PCI audit? So this one's an interesting one, and this is the one where there's, I think, a lot of confusion. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here. But ultimately, most common is the issuing bank, the bank that issues uh, the credit card in the first place, um, the one who creates the merchant account uh, with a retailer, for instance, uh, would ultimately ask for, a, for PCI compliance or a full loan PCI audit. So any entity who stores, processes, or transmits cardholder data, credit card data, is responsible to be compliant with PCI. Um, so the big question is, why would I be asked for a PCI 
audit, an actual PCI audit, not PCI compliance, but the full audit. Um, the key thing here that, um, that, that I want to help you understand is generally speaking, as a, there's two, well, let me just kind of back up. There's two ways to be PCI compliant or two different types of PCI compliance. There's one as a merchant and there's one as a service provider. The PCI merchant uh, compliance is you as a service organization collecting credit card payments. Someone orders a, um, a, a run or, you know, a, a, a print job, you know, and they pay with credit card. You collect that credit card payment. You have a, uh, therefore, you need to be PCI compliant in that case as a merchant. That would be driven by your merchant bank. So only your merchant bank would be asking you for that type of compliance. The other type of PCI compliance is as a service provider. What's happening in this case is that you're receiving credit card data from your client in order to print, to print some sort of material. And they, because they have to be PCI compliant, if they send that data to you, you have to be PCI compliant. But in this case, it's not as a merchant. You're considered a service provider in that scenario. And all service providers have to be level one compliant, which means you have to be audited. So in the case of the merchant status, you would only have to be audited if you did more than 6 million transactions a year, credit card transactions, which probably uh, many on the call, if not all, wouldn't. So wouldn't you would not need to be audited as a merchant on the merchant side. You would just need to self-certify. But if you're receiving a credit card, a data file with credit card numbers from your client, then they would ask you to actually be audited. So. Practically speaking, if your client's being audited for PCI and they send you data that has PCI or they think might have PCI, you could get asked for a PCI audit. And then next one, Sarah, so who asked for FISMA? If you do work with the federal government or work with someone who does, you're going to get asked about FISMA. So that's, uh, that's where FISMA would come into play. So let me talk a little bit about um, well, let me, uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Sarah. Summing it up. So just kind of put it on one slide. GLBA and Sarbanes-Oxy ultimately are the ones driving SSA and, and, and SOC 2 most often. And uh, it's the, the financial institutions, publicly traded companies, and state and local. HIPAA is going to be driven by healthcare providers and service providers. And then PCI is going to be driven if you're receiving PCI data or if you're going to work with someone who has a contract with federal government or with an agency directly, you know, you're going to have to be FISMA compliant. So, all right, so let's talk about what, what are these things? I mean, what is an SSA 16 in the first place and what am I getting myself into, right? So an SSA 16 is an audit and report on the internal controls you have in place as a service provider that is relevant to your client's data. So what are the things that you've done? And when I say controls, I mean policies and procedures. What are the policies and procedures that you have put in place to protect your client's data and ensure its accuracy? So those internal controls could be related to financial reporting. If you are providing a financial service to your clients, it could be over information security. It could be operational or even compliance. Um, in the real world, it's most commonly used for information security. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Most companies use it to report on information security, how we protect data. So it's performed by a, by a CPA. It has to be performed by a qualified CPA who has the experience to perform the audit. The key thing I want to help you understand is it's relevant to your client's data, not your data. So an SSA 16 is not concerned about how you protect your own employee, for instance, social security numbers. SSA 16 could, does not care about your own financial statements and how you prepare them. SSA, SSA 16 is specifically concerned with how you protect client data exclusively. So how is an SSA 16 structured? Um, it's kind of uh, unique in the sense that it's risk-based. There is no set uh, standards for SSA 16 or set requirements. If, if you get online and you Google um, SSA 16 requirements, you're going to get confused really quickly because there isn't such a, a, such a thing. SSA 16 is risk-based, which means I, what are the risks to my client? Once I understand the risks, I create an objective to mitigate that risk. 
to minimize that risk. And then I put controls in place to accomplish the objective. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So my client sends me a data file. It ultimately, that data file is being stored on the server that does my variable data printing, right? That, that's, that's driving one of, my, one of my engines. So one of the risks is that a thief would come in in the middle of the night and pick that server up and walk out the back door, right? That's a risk. So I, create, I acknowledge that risk, physical theft. So I create an objective. The objective is prevent unauthorized physical access. So that's my objective, good objective. And then what do I do? I create controls. Controls are going to be I lock doors. I might have video surveillance, uh, et cetera. So that's a control. That's the way I'm going to accomplish the objective. I'm going to lock doors. I'm going to make sure only certain employees have keys, et cetera. Those are the controls in place. And we basically, SSA 16 looks at the risks to your client, creates the appropriate objectives, and then the list of controls. So it would be common to have 150 controls, for instance, ranging from we do background checks on new employees. Again, the objective is to prevent criminals from having access to client data. We'll um, create physical access, like I mentioned, doors and locks. And then technical controls, um, things like firewalls and antivirus protection and vulnerability management. You know, we do patches on a regular basis, et cetera. So you'll create the objectives and then employ the controls. So the, the question is, what's the auditor's job? When you hire an auditor to do an SSA 16, what are we doing? Well. We're doing three things. Number one, are the objectives appropriate? You know, are they the right objectives given your risk assessment? Number one. Number two, are the controls effectively designed? Are they good controls? Will will they, if, if you do these things, is there a reasonable expectation that the objective will be met? And then number three is, are you doing what you say you do? So you you say you do these things, we look to see, are you actually doing them? Have they been implemented? And fundamentally, there's a deliverable. We deliver a report which documents all of the things that you're doing, our opinion on these three items, and then we document what it is that you're actually doing to accomplish those things. So it's a, it's a fairly detailed report that allows your client to understand what it is that, that you're doing in, in to protect their risk. So there are two types. There's a type one and a type two. The only difference is the period of time. So a type one just says, looks at one day. Are you doing these things today or April 30th? Did we don't, it doesn't matter if you were doing them yesterday. Doesn't even, it, we're not talking about what you're doing tomorrow. We're just saying today they're in place and they're good controls, right? Type two looks, however, at a period of time. We look at the same exact controls that we did in the type one, we just look more deeply. How have you been doing that over the last six months or the last year? So if you do background checks in a case of a type one, do you do background checks? Yes, show me one. Okay, you, you, you are doing that. Oh, show me the policy. Okay, you have a policy that states how you do that. Okay, great. In the case of a type two, we're gonna ask you, how many employees did you hire in the last six months? And you say, well, I hired three. And we say, well, we need to see all three background checks. So it's the same control, we're just looking more deeply. So most companies will start with a type one because they're not prepared for the audit and they need help preparing. And then once they've sort of got things in place and documented, they don't have a six month audit trail. So they'll get a type one because they can say, hey, we're doing these things today. And then they'll generally pursue a type two at some point in the future once they've had an opportunity to create a good, good audit trail. And so that's a common approach to SSA 16. So let me just tell you about what a SOC 2 is. So SOC 2 is also has to be performed by a CPA, but in this case, rather than it, the audit being flexible, the SSA 16 being flexible, you define the controls based upon the service you're providing and what the risk to your client. SOC 2 is a predefined list of requirements for security, how we protect data availability, how do we ensure that the data is going to be available, you know, that my building's not going to burn down, that, you know, again, things like redundant, you know, disaster recovery, for instance, would be relevant. Confidentiality, I'm making sure that only the people who have, um, are authorized to see this data actually see it, right? Um, when someone comes in to clean the building at night, they can't access the data. That would be confidentiality. Um, the data is still secure, but I don't want to, I, I want to keep someone from looking at it that shouldn't. Processing integrity just means that I do things accurately, and privacy means how do I manage um, the data 
relationship between the end consumer and the data. Usually privacy does not apply to the service provider. Usually privacy would apply to your client um, since they're the ones that deal directly with the consumer. So again, it's just an audit that has a predefined list of criteria and you have to meet, meet the criteria. Next, HIPAA. So a HIPAA audit is an audit of the internal controls that you have in place to protect for PHI. And again, HIPAA legislation says you have to have appropriate physical, administrative, and technical safeguards in place to protect health information. And this, ironically, is a lot like SSA 16 because HIPAA doesn't have a hard list, checklist of requirements. It has general requirements that have to be applied to the organization. So the appropriate controls for a printing organization would be different than a data center. It would certainly be different than a billing service, for instance, or a claims processor. So it, the, the first step is to determine what are the appropriate safe guards, and then are we doing those things? And I'm not going to talk too much about FISMA. Um, I, the one thing I will say, oh, PCI, sorry. So PCI audit. Uh, a PCI audit is an audit of six control objectives with 12 subject areas. Um, there's within those six uh, objectives and 12 areas, there's approximately 212 controls that have to be assessed. Um, they're all related to how you protect credit card data, and ultimately it results in a, what's called a report on compliance, or if you're talking with a client, a ROC, as it's, as it's commonly called, ROC, a ROC. This is, uh, when you talk about a ROC, you're, that's the equivalent to PCI certification. So when someone says PCI certification, they're talking about a report on compliance, or they're talking about a ROC, and they'll say to you, do you have a ROC? And that's, that's what they mean. You've been third-party audited and there's been a, a report on compliant issued. So it's, it's pretty detailed uh, audit. It's pretty stringent and, um, and, and robust. So lastly, I believe this one is FISMA. Uh, FISMA is, oh, there this, for, for those of you that will be re receiving the uh, PowerPoint uh, after the uh, call today, you will be receiving an email thanking you, and in that email, you'll be able to download the presentation and just want to make sure that you have, this is, just want to make sure this slide was in there so that you have it as a reference point for what the, the PCI requirements are. So a FISMA audit is a thorough, and I'm using the word thorough assessment of your information security practices because the FISMA audit is, is by far the most difficult of all the ones we've talked about. It's a very robust information security program. It has a detailed risk assessment, a comprehensive list of controls. Ultimately, you do have to determine whether you're low, moderate, or high category. Most are going to be moderate. Uh, high category, you'd have to be working directly with the Department of Defense, for example, some to, to be classified high, but you're probably going to be low or, or moderate category. Uh, but again, only applies if you're really dealing with the federal government. Um, so the positive and negative here is it's the most difficult to get, but because it's the most difficult to get, most don't pursue it, and therefore there's much less competition for, uh, for federal printing business, obviously. So, okay, next, um, next slide. So that's sort of an overview of, of what they are and, and why you, you might, um, you know, be requested and also why you might pursue it if you're looking to get into the publicly traded space more or penetrate financial institutions, state and local government, or if you want to work with, um, you know, uh, printing that relates to credit card data. And certainly if you're look, looking to pursue uh, federal business as well, you kind of have a sense of which audits that you might need to pursue. Um, just a little bit about why I work with us. I did want to, you know, we obviously perform these services and we would like you to, to use us. Um, several reasons. One, we do work in the industry ex extensively and have a tremendous experience. So we understand the, the nature of the business um, that you're in. We have dedicated expertise. We don't do any other type service as a CPA. We don't have a tax practice or a financial auditing practice or et cetera. This is all we do. So our entire experience is uh, related to this. So. You know, 99% of CPAs can't do this type of audit because of the 
information security background it requires, but this is all we do. So we're very qualified to provide guidance and mentoring and readiness. We utilize an online methodology that takes you through the process using an online tool over the course of weeks that allows us to prepare you and mentor you through the process rather than the traditional method of having an auditor come out, spend a couple weeks on site, and when you're not prepared, um, it, which is very disruptive and generally makes the process very difficult because ultimately you're, you're not prepared and then there needs to be a second visit, et cetera. It just makes the, the cost high and, and the time frame long. So we kind of uh, eliminated that. And also one of the advantages to working with us is if you need multiple audits, um, we can do that in one process. So we can conduct an SSA 16 and a HIPAA audit at the same time. And because there's so much overlap, we can do that at a reduced overall cost. So the last and, and probably one of the best is the discounted pricing um, through the printing uh, associations that, that are represented here today. Uh, we have a strategic relationship. There are significant uh, discounts um, through the organization to, to get an audit. Um, you know, the, you'll, you'll find if, if you've looked into this in the past, you'll find that it's pretty expensive. And I think if you, you um, reach out to your uh, affiliates, um, you'll find uh, you'll be, you'll be pleasantly surprised. So um, that's probably one of the, the biggest reasons. So uh, we do have a question in the Q&A box, and, and I just before we get off the call today, I'm going to open it up for questions. So uh, feel free if there was a question that came up in your mind as, as you went through, if you can go ahead and throw it in the Q&A box at the top there, that red Q&A button, uh, or the chat window as well, if, if, you, if um, for some reason it's easier to click on the, uh, the, the chat. Uh, window as well. I've got both of them open here and, and I'll be able to look through and, and answer those questions. So the first question I have here is, um, I, if I'm understanding right, the SSA 16 and SOC 2 apply for the same types of businesses. Are they interchangeable at all? This is a really, really good question. So um, they, yeah, yes and no, right? So ultimately, and I get this question a lot. Here's the question I get a lot from clients and prospective clients is, is which one should I do, right? Should I do an SSA 16 or SOC 2? And the answer to the question, my answer to the question is, is what, whatever your clients are asking you for. So financial institutions and public traded companies are most familiar with SSA 16, and so they ask for SSA 16 because that's what they're familiar with. Um, and so if that's what you're hearing from clients, then I would say do that. If you have a client asking you for a SOC 2, then ultimately, obviously, you want to pursue the SOC 2. Um, however, yes, the answer is yes in this sense that typical, a SOC 2 is, a, is, a, is an audit over information security primarily and can include other things like availability and confidentiality, for an example. And you are fully capable of covering those same topics within an SSA 16 as well. So many of our clients will pursue, in fact, a SOC 2, will just do one audit, but will actually write an SSA 16 report based upon the SOC 2 audit. So we only do one audit and one audit effort, but we write two reports from the same effort. So. If I didn't answer that question, um, you know, go ahead and, and throw me a new one up there, but hopefully that, that answered the question. So would printing insurance ID cards require HIPAA compliance? So here's the key with, with HIPAA, probably is the answer to that question, but what HIPAA requires is any two pieces of data that an outsider could correlate together would be considered um, uh, protected under HIPAA. So if um, there are two pieces of information on that insurance card that would allow a, a person to be identified with a specific account number, for instance, or in any way, then, um, then it would need to be protected. So, you know, an insurance card has a name and has a, um, you know, an account number. Um, could could need to be yes you know that that you know you very well may get may get that request. Um, so how long does it take to realize the ROI? Great question. Pay for the cost. So so if you look you know you look there at, reach out to your affiliate you'll get the the pricing there they they have that. Um, 
it, it depends. It depends on the size of the contract. You know, that, that's a that's one of those things that you'll need to do is math. I will tell you this though that relates to calculating ROI is one SSA 16 report will satisfy every client that asks for SSA 16. You do not do a separate SSA 16 audit for each client. You do one SSA 16 and then every request gets the same report. So the first client's obviously gonna have to do enough business um, to warrant the SSA 16, or you have to believe that there's, or you have reason to believe I'm going to be able, I'm gonna have three or four more clients like this. Obviously in the in the financial industry, this is particularly true. Even the smallest one location credit union will require an SSA 16. But if I decide to go after that business, I get one, then I get two, I get three, I get four, I get five, I get 10. Because, particularly because I have the, the SSA 16, now that cost is distributed across multiple clients. So it, it, it really depends on the size of the client and or um, the number of clients. Um, any read on how much of a premium printers are charging for having either? You know, that's an interesting question. Over the years, I have talked to clients um, who it's just a cost to do in business, obviously. Um, they use it competitively and they say, listen, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm more because, you know, my, it's built into their cost, in other words, and I'm more because I maintain this compliance. You have to meet GLBA. You can work with me and, um, and know that, that you're compliant, right? I've also had other clients who, um, if their client requires it, they, they bill a fee. Or I've had clients that actually bill a fee for the report itself. Um, so if you want a copy of the report, it's it's a thousand dollars or it's fifteen hundred dollars. It's really interesting. Um, uh, there is no rules that would limit you um, from a business owner making um, making that decision. Ultimately, and and of course your relationship with with the client would would be a big big factor as well. So um, I think you can be as creative as as you want to be there. But I will tell you this, if your competitor, if another printer doesn't have an SSA 16 and the business is a financial institution or a publicly traded company and it has financial data and, and then, um, you know, then the other printer has a significant disadvantage uh, because they're going to have to be audited by the client in order for the client to meet their requirements. So the client will have additional costs and you want to be educated about that and you want to bring that obviously to the attention of your, your prospective client here, and if you calculated the cost of, of that compliance, right? Um, so who is the liable party if we're, not, if we're not asked to provide an audit report? Ultimately, your, the publicly traded company is responsible by law to protect financial reporting and any systems that would impact financial reporting. It's their job to make sure that you have adequate internal control. Ultimately, they would be responsible. That would be the case with GLBA as well. The financial institution is the one responsible for, for protecting the data. And ultimately, their due diligence, so the liability will ultimately fall there. But when it comes to HIPAA, the opposite is true. In the case of HIPAA, so in 2013 in September, um, as part of ongoing HIPAA high-tech legislation, the omnibus rule was issued, which was clarification on the High-Tech Act, which was the update to HIPAA. And the omnibus rule specifically made the service provider equally liable to protect PHI. So whether you have a report or not, um, is totally not relevant. Under federal law, you are responsible to protect PHI and you are fully uh, responsible in all the penalties, fines, et cetera, that um, the Department of Health and Human Services can employ can go directly to you. So they would most likely fine the covered entity or the business, you know, as well, the healthcare organization, but they could come and fine you directly as well. So you, you are liable in that case. Um, is there a list of SSA 16's printers published? No. So the AICPA, who manages and maintains the audit standard, SSA 16 and SOC 2, um, do not maintain a directory of companies who've, had, who've been audited. So that would, um, 
you know, there's there's no such requirement, so therefore there's no standardized um, list. So, um, so uh, got a, a horror story to tell. Uh, you'd have to you'd have to give me more uh, more um, an idea of of the of what you're looking for there. Um, I, I will tell you in terms of HIPAA, this is probably pr really pretty relevant to you because uh, printing obviously statements, um, healthcare statements, billing statements, you know, uh, and the healthcare industry obviously being a big, big piece of the business. So I don't know if you've been watching the news, but if you go to our blog, KirkpatrickPrice.com, and you go to our blog, there's a post um, here oh, t well, a few weeks ago uh, about the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights. So the Office of Civil Rights, which is a division of Health and Human Services, uh, announced back just two, three months ago, that they were going to begin active supervision of the largest healthcare organizations and business associates, meaning service providers. In the past, up until just now, literally, um, Health and Human Services, the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights Division of Health and Human Services, didn't pursue action enforcement action unless there was a breach. So like Anthem, Anthem has a big, Anthem Healthcare has a big breach. Now the federal government's coming out, they're gonna be doing investigations, they're gonna, you know, wherever they find that you weren't compliant with HIPAA and that resulted in the breach, and then there's going to be sanctions and fees and it's gonna be ugly, right? It's gonna be ugly. But it's always been reactive. You have to have a breach and then they come in. Now, beginning in 2015, the OCR is going to be actively auditing, proactively auditing these entities, which is similar to what happens now. The FDIC, the OCC, right, um, the CFPB, they come in and audit banks, for instance, every year. The big ones quarterly, the smaller ones annually, but they get a visit from the federal government every year which is why they diligently ask for SSA 16 because the federal auditor is going to be checking. So that's why you always hear it. And the same thing with Sarbanes-Oxley, they have to have an annual audit done by a public, by a public accounting firm and to comply with SOX, right? And that drives the SSA 16. Well, we have not seen that in HIPAA, in healthcare space prior, that's all about to change. So what you're going to be seeing is a higher focus on HIPAA compliance because the federal on-site audits are going to push pressure downward proactively rather than reactively. So, um, okay, I got you, I got you. Is there a case where, um, so a horror story to tell? No, I mean, not a huge horror story here. The horror story would be uh, for a printer that just can't compete. Um, they just can't get the business. So it's a publicly traded company. It's a financial institution. It's a state and local RFP. You know, um, you know, like a like a, a water utility or something, um, where they just simply couldn't get the business. They couldn't either respond to the RFP or they lost the business again. They were disqualified immediately because they didn't have one. You know, that's the biggest horror story on the SSA 16 side. Is I just can't get that business. That business is unavailable to me. I I'm left with the um, you know, the private sector and non-financial institutions and things like that. Um, what would be interesting to do is to do a quick Google on um, healthcare breaches that had to do with the printer because that's where the horror stories would, would come into play. Um, it's frequent that healthcare breach isn't actually done at the healthcare provider, but actually the service provider was the one that breached the data um, has been a common place. And, and, but now, like I said, post September 2013, you get fined. Previously, they would find the covered entity and it would be the, it would be the healthcare organization's job to then sue, in this case, the printer. Now the government can do it directly. So it'd be interesting. I haven't, I have not done that. I have not done that, but that's, that's a worthwhile to Google. These are fantastic questions, by the way. Any, um, I still have time, so are there any other questions? Or if I, if, if I didn't answer your question um, um, to, uh, to your uh, satisfaction, is you know, you wanna provide any additional questions, that'd be great. 
All right. Well, fantastic. These are these are great questions. I just want to thank everyone um, for for joining us today. Um, you know, my contact information is here on the slide. I'd be happy to ask answer additional questions. Uh, please reach out to your affiliate as well. They have the pre-negotiated pricing, which we can provide you as well. But certainly reach out to them. Um, they have they have that information, and you know, we perform other services as well, as you saw on on the, on the slide, penetration testing services and things like that as well. So I'd um, be happy to talk with you about some of those uh, additional services. So again, thank you all for attending. Um, just want to thank our, our affiliates and, uh, and the partnership there. Brian, is there anything else you want to say before we uh, conclude today? Just, uh, thanks for attending. And I believe that all the affiliates and Kirkpatrick Price will have this presentation up on our websites as well. Great. And Brian, everyone will be receiving a thank you email from the webinar today, correct, with a link that to is, download the presentation? That is correct. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for everyone uh, joining today. Have a great afternoon.